Hi, everyone. Welcome to our, our National Kidney Foundation Facebook Live. Um, I'm Caitlin Engel. I'm a registered dietitian and the program development director here at NKF. I'm joined by Dr. Joseph Azalotti, a nephrologist, clinical professor at the Mount Sinai Health System and NKF's chief medical officer. Um, to get started today, we are going to continue sharing important information for the kidney community about the risks posed by coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. Steps you can take to protect yourself and also to update you on some of the things that we're doing to better serve the kidney community during this crisis. Um, so Dr. Vazelotti, um, if you want to get started with reviewing some of the things we covered last week related to um, important precautions that kidney patients and really everyone can take to prevent exposure to the virus. Terrific, thank you, Caitlin. So we discussed a little bit last week uh, that the coronavirus and the disease it causes is being called COVID-19, um, that that is transmitted from person to person uh, through droplets. And this is a, an image that I took from Esquire magazine, which shows you what might happen uh, with a sneeze or a cough. And so of course, um, one of the things that we wanna emphasize is washing your hands uh, for 20 seconds, uh, with ideally with warm soap and water. Um, we want to emphasize the importance of not touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, or your face, especially when you're outdoors, especially when you may be interacting with others. Um, uh, of course, um, even when you enter your house from coming outside, you still want to limit the touching of the face uh, before you get that opportunity to wash your hands um, upon returning. Then. In addition to that, uh, based on the image I just showed you, six feet of distance is what's being recommended, which kind of makes sense based on that spread that was shown. So you wanna maintain the social distancing. So we're physically distant from each other, but um, hopefully we're not socially distant. So maintain that physically uh, distancing. And then of course, you wanna do everything you can to limit your exposure. So for most of us, it's gonna be staying home most of the time, unless we're essential workers. It's going to be um, really just limiting your outdoor trips to uh, visits to the pharmacy or the uh, food market, um, or uh, hopefully you'll be starting to think about physical activity and walking, getting some exercise. Um, the other thing that I've been asked a lot about is about medications that we can take to prevent um, the virus. So uh, hydroxychloroquine has probably gotten the most attention. That's a drug that's used to treat lupus and rheumatoid arthritis uh, normally. Um, the information on that is not that strong, actually. There's some in vitro or test tube-like evidence that it might be beneficial, and there is some evidence that it might work in, uh, in terms of how it clears the virus from the body in a small number of patients. Uh, and we've certainly heard stories, anecdotal stories from Europe and from the United States that patients who were taking that went on to develop COVID-19 with bilateral pneumonia. So um, for all those reasons, it's not something we should just be taking to prevent um, the, uh, the, the risk of developing COVID-19. And it's certainly some, not something you should do on your own. And we want you to do that with your clinicians in a, ideally would be in a controlled uh, trial format. And lastly, I'll just mention that because patients with lupus, about half of whom have kidney disease themselves um, need um, hydroxychloroquine for their ongoing care. It's so important that we don't um, prevent people from getting the medications they need just because we're taking something on our own. And that would be the case for any uh, preventative therapy. We have to be really careful about misinformation in the community, uh, be cautious about preventative therapies, and don't think if you're using something that you think is preventative, which we don't recommend in the first place, that doesn't replace the social distancing and the hand washing um, that, that I discussed per previously. Thank you so much. Um, we've received a, received a number of questions about what dialysis providers are doing right now to protect patients from the virus. Could you talk about some of those? Sure, so the, um, there are a number of recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, to help uh, dialysis clinics um, prevent uh, exposure to the virus and help keep patients safe in the time of this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. 
So uh, some of the things that I already mentioned, like the hand washing, uh, the social distancing, some of those things are, are going to be uh, re-emphasized, so I won't repeat those. But then um, your staff may be wearing different types of protective equipment. So masks, they may be wearing face shields. Um, you may be screened uh, with questions. You, your temperature may be taken before um, you uh, enter the dialysis facility or as part of the process uh, before you start the dialysis treatment. And then uh, the dialysis clinics are working uh, in areas where the virus is uh, is an outbreak to um, distance patients who are who have the infection um, to limit uh, visitors that may be part of what's done D the last shift of the day may be de dedicated to patients who are infected to allow the unit to be cleaned in a terminal way um, or terminal cleaning at the uh, end of the day and then uh, eat where it's where the outbreak is uh, uh, peaking, there may be dialysis clinics that are devoted completely to patients um, who are infected. So there is a lot of work that's going on to help uh, protect dialysis patients during this time. And uh, I should say that many dialysis centers will ask you to wear a mask yourself what, during the dialysis treatment and the other patients in the clinic. And I think that's certainly something you should work with your dialysis clinics on, but that's certainly something we, sh we uh, will support. And then lastly, um, it's important to show up for your dialysis treatments, that whether you're doing it at home or in a clinic, uh, continue the dialysis treatments as before. Don't skip a dialysis treatment for fear of COVID-19 because that could put you at risk for hospitalization from a complication from kidney failure. So very important uh, to continue dialysis treatments as before. Thank you, that's great information. Um, what about the transplant patients out there? What special precautions should they take? So I think both for dialysis patients and transplant patients, we want to emphasize the importance to continue your chronic medication. So continue them as prescribed, try not to skip them or, um, or, pay, or separate them, space them. It's important for kidney transplant patients, especially to take uh, your immunosuppressive uh, treatments, drugs to prevent uh, rejection and to keep your kidney transplant healthy. Um, I think both for kidney transplant patients and dialysis patients, if you think you're sick, if you think you may have the um, COVID-19, which uh, symptoms typically would be um, fever, uh, sore throat, uh, stuffy, uh, runny nose, um, and uh, shortness of breath would be the most uh, serious sign. You should, of course, be in touch with your dialysis clinic or your um, transplant center. Uh, for next steps and for care, particularly for the outpatient dialysis clinic. Um, as I mentioned before, you may have a special arrangement with when your dialysis treatment will take place or how it will take place according to whether or not you have the infection um, or not. And then, of course, the kidney transplant team may um, change your therapies or may adjust therapies according to uh, whether or not you're infected. Great. Thank you. Um, and another question that we're getting a lot here at NKF is around um, masks. Do you want to talk at all about that? Yes, yeah, so that's coming up a lot. So I'll, I'll just quickly show you a picture um, of two different kinds. These are medical masks. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of these is called a face mask or a surgical mask, and that's the blue one here. And the other one is an N95 respirator, and that's shown here. That's more typically like a dome shape, although not always, depending on the on the, the type. So those are different masks that are, are available. We want you to, in general, avoid this N95 mask. You really want that to be for your healthcare professional. This requires training and a fit test uh, to wear, and it's really not something that, at this point, um, we should be using routinely in dialysis clinics or, or otherwise. Um, the surgical mask may be something that your dialysis clinic provides. So obviously the surgical mask can help um, prevent you from doing this to the people around you. And if everyone around you is wearing that in the dialysis clinic, then of course you all have that uh, similar protection. So I think that's uh, important for us to understand. Um, the CDC has not come up with a, a guidance for this yet, but they're at least apparently considering 
that we wear masks even when we go out in public in general that would be for all americans so that's something that's being considered it that may be more like a homemade mask and mm -hmm. um so homemade masks are something to consider it's probably be better than nothing um you probably want to make sure that if it's is it disposable or is it, if it's a, a scarf do you that's something that you want to wash um mm -hmm. on your return but certainly we would want um want that's something we want you to consider and i i think it would be helpful if we had some guidance from the ctc about um how to make a mask but i have mm -hmm. seen some guidance um from the minnesota department of health so we can yeah. certainly reference that in our facebook live um some recommendations about how to make a a mask at home but i think mm -hmm. all these are things worth considering the most important thing i can probably say about masks are they're they're an important um, incremental benefit, I think, to consider, but the mask doesn't replace um, the other things that we discussed in terms yeah. of the social distancing and the hand washing. That's that's a really good reminder. Thank you. Um, so what can patients do to be proactive about keeping themselves healthy? I know you've touched on some of this so far, but outside of their treatment routine, is there anything else that um, they should be doing right now? Yes, thank you. So I think now that a lot of people are home and uh, we're both at home now, mm -hmm. um, the challenge I think is to keep up with the ingredients of health. So three ingredients I think are physical activity, nutrition, and social engagement. So physical activity, you, you know, uh, a lot of people are I've talked to um, friends, uh, family members are telling me they they think they're gaining weight. So uh, because of what's happening, so uh, you need to think about how you can get that physical activity that you need. Um, mm -hmm. That um, that maybe we don't realize that just like uh, eating um, three square meals a day, getting physical activity every day is really an essential ingredient of health. So whether it's mm -hmm. taking a walk with social distancing, whether it's a stationary bicycle, um, you think about ways that you can integrate physical activity in a safe way um, in your lifestyle and maybe start to think too about how you can schedule things. You know, we're used to having schedules, work schedules, school schedules, different life schedules, and all that is disrupted now. So try to think about how you can coordinate those. Uh, of course, we want um, our uh, patients with kidney disease, people living with kidney disease to have access to healthy food. Um, I would refer you to the National Kidney Foundation website that has a lot of resources about keeping a pantry, how to store food in times like this, and uh, with uh, healthy uh, recommendations uh, of recipes for patients with impaired kidney function or, or treated with dialysis um, can uh, can take advantage of. And that's uh, that website is kidney.org backslash COVID-19, or if you just go to kidney.org, um, the, the main page, you'll see a link where you can click on to, to find more information there that's being updated and curated. And there are a lot of useful, simple questions that are addressed in mm -hmm. more detail than uh, Caitlin and I can can describe in the next few minutes. Yeah, that's... The last thing, yeah, oh, one more sorry, thing I should say is make sure you keep in touch with people. So this is an easy mm -hmm. time to be, feel lonely, feel isolated, maybe get, feel down, feel blue. You know, uh, this is a time to reach out to others, you know, reach mm -hmm. out to your family members, reach out to the neighbor who maybe is alone, talk to your other, if you're in a dialysis clinic, maybe, um, engage with the dialysis patients that you uh that you're acquainted with whatever the the way you want to do it it's important to to maintain your social um contacts and maybe mm -hmm. even think about i've heard people doing virtual uh, dinner parties and all kinds of ways yeah. think about how you can get uh creative with that but i think it's important that we're social um beings we're social people so it's important mm -hmm. to keep that going at this time yeah i think that's great i've heard the term distance socializing instead of social distancing to emphasize mm -hmm. that we should still be keeping in touch with other people and having that social time. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, um, but do you want to just talk a little bit about some of the other things that we're doing here at NKF to protect patients during this time? Uh, yes, thank you. So there's been a lot of uh, advocacy uh, with our um, government relations team, and that's really been coordinated uh, throughout the organization. Um, I, I mentioned the educational offerings um, through the kidney learning system that are on the webpage. Um, I think one of the one important uh, step forward was that the National Kidney Foundation, with the American Society of Nephrology, wrote a letter to Secretary Alex Azar um, about um, the potential scarcities of equipment 
uh, protective uh, equipment for our healthcare professionals that are so important to maintain the care of our dialysis patients outside the hospital and our patients who are hospitalized. Um, so uh, I think that's a really important uh, step forward. Um, the National Kidney Foundation also has been um, working with government agencies um, about a surgical procedure. So we wanna make sure that um, a kidney transplantation and uh, dialysis preparation surgeries like uh, vascular access for hemodialysis and perineal dialysis catheter insertion, that those are given a higher priority than other routine surgeries that might be uh, postponed. And we're so pleased that um, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, did put out a guidance that really helped prioritize that. So we understand that it might be difficult for um, at times for kidney transplant to occur in, in this outbreak, but we want to do our very best, um, particularly for deceased donor transplant, to try to maintain um, deceased donor transplant in this time. And we're so pleased that uh, Center for Medicare and Medicare Services supported that. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I would say that, um, you know, there are concerns about discrimination or that uh, patients will be withheld therapies because they have kidney disease in a time of crisis. So uh, the National Kidney Foundation is doing its best and working very hard to try to prevent that um, from happening. And we, um, we understand that, uh, you know, clinical judgment uh, is something that we can't uh, infringe upon. But on the other hand, um, we understand that some states and some local uh, organizations are trying to have policies uh, that may not take into the nuance of individualized care. So mm -hmm. we just, we're working hard um, uh, there as well. And then I, th I think the last thing I would mention, we, we want to understand the risk for our patients. So what is the risk for a dialysis patient uh, in terms of developing um, COVID-19? It seems like the risk might be uh, greater than the general population, but we want to understand proportionally how much greater mm -hmm. is the risk. What, is there an increased risk for kidney transplant recipients? We want to understand that. And so uh, that will hopefully uh, better inform the care. And also we want to understand how um, vaccines, preventative therapies, and treatments for existing COVID-19 play out in our uh, patient population as well. Mm -hmm. And there's a tremendous amount of research that's going on now in terms of um, developing a vaccine, developing prophylactic or preventative therapies, and developing um, therapies that treat um, mild and, and severe uh, disease. Thank you. Yeah, that's, there's so much going on. I'm always surprised at how busy everybody is um, just all over trying to deal with this. Um, I'll also make a plug for, um, as you've already mentioned, our kidney.org slash coronavirus site is constantly being updated with more resources and information for patients. And then of course, our CARES and PEERS lines are always there for, for additional questions or support. Um, so now I'm gonna turn to some of the audience questions that we've been getting from our Facebook Live attendees. Um, so Diana Davis asked um, a question about going in for blood work or other appointments, um, how people can limit risk when they do have to go to places for medical appointments. Great, so thank you for asking the question. Um, the, I think in general, we wanna limit our routine appointments. So in general, at this time, all non-urgent appointments, we should try to convert those to video visits or telephone visits or televisits if possible. And certainly um, I have some experience with that. I think it can work out really well. Um, I would also say dental visits because uh, they involve the mouth can potentially spread the virus to others or you can um, potentially be exposed. So I think dental visits, anything routine you want to postpone until we're through this difficult time together. Uh, as far as blood drawing, what I, I think what I would recommend is, um, first of all, do I really need the blood draw? Does it have to be right now? You know, is, am I doing well? And I, I only have my blood tested once a year. Maybe that, you know, maybe uh, this is not the time to do it. Maybe I'll wait a month or two and hopefully we'll be in, in a, we'll have a better country then. Well, our country will be in a better uh, situation then. Um, if it's an important test that I have done that maybe is part of a video visit that I have coming up and I want to have those tests available when I interact with my clinician, there are different ways of doing that. But I think trying to have the test ordered in advance, trying to schedule the appointment, maybe at an off time, um, calling ahead to make sure that everything is ready. Um, and then of course, paying attention to social distancing 
and the, the things we mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, uh, when you have the blood drawn, there are some places and some capacity and have some experience with this too, that you can go to the, um, you can have the phlebotomist come to your home to do the blood test. Now that may be uh, and urine, urine collection. That may, be, uh, may vary depending on local availability and the type of health insurance you have, but that's another option that's at least worth considering. So I would schedule um, a, as quick an outpatient in and out uh, testing that you possibly can or um, consider home testing if it's available in your area. That's, that's really great advice. Thanks for, for covering that. Um, another question that came through was from Chrissy, and she wants to know about the effect um, or additional risks for people who have one kidney. So maybe kidney donors or people who are born with one kidney, do they face any additional risks or is there anything else that they should be doing? This question has come up a, a lot. So what is the, the risk to me if I have a, I'm a kidney donor or if I had a kidney removed? Um, for uh, because I had a kidney tumor perhaps in the past, or you know uh, I think about one in two to five hundred people is born with one kidney. So I think in general I would my estimate of this is that your risk is probably similar to the general population. Period. Um, uh, but we don't have any data for that, and this is another area that would be good to collect data moving forward. Um, the main risks for severe COVID nineteen seem to be seniors, so people probably about 65 and older, people with pre-existing conditions like um, pulmonary disease, asthma, uh, COPD or emphysema, and uh, cancer patients who are treated with chemotherapy especially, and then there, uh, the people with diabetes and people with kidney disease that I mentioned at the beginning also seem to be at increased risk. Um, so if you're a kidney donor, if you've had a kidney removed or what we call a nephrectomy, if you fit into one of those groups, then it wouldn't be the kidney donation or the nephrectomy that would put you at increased risk. It would be the fact that you have emphysema or the fact that you're 72 years old. Those, those conditions um, or, or your age would put you at increased risk. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I, I know if I have that question as well because my dad's actually a kidney donor. So he's been asking me what he should do. So that's great to know. Um, another question came through from Kathy S. And she wants to know, she's heard that people with blood type A have increased risk of getting COVID-19 or maybe have worse issues with it. Is there any um, truth to that, that maybe rumor going around? Yeah, I've, I've heard clinicians tell me that. And I, uh, to be honest, I haven't read the data on that. I would say, so what though? You know, uh, I'm, I happen to be type A, uh, what am I gonna do? You know, I can't change the type of blood that I have. And okay. if you're type O, maybe, I, I don't see how that helps you that much. You still have to do the things um, that um, that you need to do. I would say, think about the things that are reversible, right? Smoking is probably the most important thing to mention that clearly has increased risks, probably for not only for uh, contracting the virus or becoming infected, but also um, for severe infection. I've seen a, a reasonably good amount of data to support that. So if you smoke, this is a fantastic time um, to, to stop. Yeah. So focus on the things that you can control and not, not the things that are out of your control for yes. your risk. Um, another question is coming through from Melissa and she asks when a vaccine is available, will transplant, um, or kidney patients, those who are at high risk, um, be higher on the list to receive it or will they get any priority? Um, of course, this is a decision that the country has to make and that, uh, hopefully that we'll get guidance um, from the CDC and um, other health organizations that are involved in um, vaccination. Uh, but I would envision that healthcare professionals would be probably very high on the list. And I think solid organ transplant recipients would be very high on the list. Um, maybe uh, lung transplant recipients might be the, even the highest of all. And then all other solid organ transplant recipients, kidney, uh, patients treated with dialysis would be up there. And of course, the other groups that I mentioned, COPD, asthma, the elderly, you know, diabetes, you would uh, cardiovascular disease, I didn't mention, but I think that's also there. So you would want um, uh, cancer patients who have um, chemotherapy, you know, uh, all those individuals that are at high risk should uh, take uh, priority or should, should be probably in the first or second tier of, of individuals that are vaccinated. And we're hoping that we're months away you know, uh, from a vaccine, maybe a year, 
depending on how the, the trials go. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, a good question is coming in from Amber about, um, are there any things you can do to um, be able to sanitize or reuse masks, spraying it with alcohol to dry it and drying it to reuse it? Um, or is the best practice just to get a new mask? Well, that's a great question, Amber. I think it depends on the type of mask you're using. You know, if you're using something that's made of cloth or a scarf, of course, you can just wash that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other masks really have to do with the type of mask. If a mask is soiled or if the mask is not, the integrity is broken, there's a tear in it, a rip, you know, obviously you have to discard that. Um, and I think that we're, one of the reasons I'm hoping that we'll get guidance from the CDC are these are the kinds of questions I think you know, that will probably be more dependent on the material that's used and um, having guidance on that. I think in terms of not only how the mask is made, but how it's cared for and potentially reused uh, would be important. And I think the other thing you can do um, that the CDC has been emphasizing is, you know, prolonged use. You know, so if, um, if you're going to go to the market and you're going to go to the pharmacy, maybe you make those trips in one journey and you wear one mask instead of coming home and then going back and using another mask, for example. So um, prolonged use is a way that you, we can uh, save uh, or um, increase the lifespan of the use of a mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, a question that came in that I thought was really help or really good from Kathy. Um, she's asking about um, potential appointments being canceled. Um, she asks if a peritoneal catheter placement surgery is canceled, what would be the options for a patient needing dialysis but not yet having that catheter placed? Yeah, these are difficult times, Kathy, and uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I think that it really depends on your con situation. You know, if you are um, not yet on dialysis, and maybe you're having mild symptoms, um, uh, may, what we would call mild uremic symptoms, maybe some fatigue. You know, it may be that your clinician is thinking that the risk of starting dialysis and having you insert a peritoneal dialysis catheter and start doing your uh, home training, which usually is, requires almost every day, um, the risk of that in the, in, in the current environment of where you live may be greater uh, the risk of the exposure to the virus may be greater than the benefit you'll get from starting dialysis now. And that um, work with your, your team, your care team to see, maybe they want to try to hold you over for a few weeks to months and do everything they possibly can with the medications. This is a, a critical time for you to take all your medications, be very careful with your dietary, um, um, I guess, uh, adhering to your dietary prescriptions, you know, try to avoid eating too much salt or too much potassium containing foods if your potassium runs high. Um, if you take medications that bind phosphorus or potassium, you're gonna to wanna to, of course continue those medications. Um, if you're having more um, severe symptoms um, and you're having trouble and you don't think you you can make weeks to months, you know, then it's you need to recontact your team, be in touch with your team. You know, then um, it may be that I think we lost you. Dr. Vasilati, I think we lost your sound. I think we, we lost your sound there at the end of that, that answer, but um, we are at four or five o'clock Eastern time. So I think um, I just want to say thank you so much for your responses and your time today. I know we had a lot of questions on our Facebook Live that we didn't get to, um, but we are out of time for today. So I wanted to just first and foremost thank Dr. Vazalati for his um, great insight and time today, and then thank all our viewers for joining us on this Facebook Live.